All right, welcome back in to 4th and 5. I'm DJ Williams. That's Josh Throne. And we're going to get right to it, Josh. Uh, we've been consistent each and every week at, as we said, week one, keeping it real. Uh, we've uh, started to get a little following here on 4th and 5, and people just ready to hear what we have to say about the firing of offensive coordinator Dan Enos. Uh, just seven games in to his mm. first year. Mm -hmm. um, details with his contracts. He had a three-year deal worth $3.2 million. Um, I think that's right. I could be wrong with that number. I know us firing him now eventually is going to save us around $725,000 opposed to him playing out or at least being here for that whole entire contract. But all that being said, Josh, um, we will start with Dan Enos. And uh, I'm going to say this first here on 4th and Five. That man that you see right there, Josh Throne, you were talking about issues and starting to call with people out, and you felt like we needed to really start with the offensive coordinator. And uh, like I said, you're not the type to call for people's jobs, so it has to, it had to have been bad enough back then. But you said two weeks ago you felt like Dan Enos needed to go, and here we are. You know, I think the Arkansas media as a whole sometimes – now there's, there's, there's plenty of good people in the media that, that will say it like it is. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but sometimes I think that, you know, they got to go into the press box. They got to go into the postgame pressers. They don't want to say things a little too early because then if they say it and then it doesn't happen, um, you know, you got to see that guy. And then that gets a little uncomfortable. I just felt like this, you know, it, it, it's been obvious all season long that he is not the guy to coach this particular team. Um, and he proved he's not the guy because this particular team showed you all season that they are not a pro style offensive team right now. KJ's not a pro style quarterback. The offensive line can't pass block properly. You've already shown us so much film where they do not have the proper technique, the want to, the desire. I don't know what it is, but they ain't got it. But what we do know they've been successful at is an RPO offense. And the, and the main difference in that is the offensive line has to run block on almost every single play. Pass protection, people are dropping back, trying to protect the edge, create a pocket for KJ, sit in it, kind of a Tom Brady-esque style offense where he can sit in there, stand in there, and deliver a pass. He's not that guy. That's not what makes him great. What makes him great is his threat to run. What makes him great is his threat to pull the ball from Rocket Sanders and take off and beat you to the edge because you've lulled him to sleep with that run. What's great is when you think he's going to run, he can pull it and pass. The RPO makes KJ be able to be an athlete on the field that can do all things. And so I just think that uh, it should have been found sooner. We probably should have even pulled the plug sooner. But I am thankful that Sam Pittman, you know, stepped up to the plate and fired what was his old boss that he was now, uh, mm -hmm. you know, over, which I think is an interesting situation. We talked about that a little while ago. Yeah, so uh, what's interesting about what you said, uh, I know a lot of people are going to hear that and they're going to say this, well, Josh, Dan Enos just isn't going to come here and run Kendall Brown's mm -hmm. offense just because. So this is how this works, okay? Um, Please tell them. And um, offensive coordinators, yes, they have their schemes, they have what they want to do, but at the end of the day, the end of the day, you have to work with what you have. And what he had was a lack of talent in an offensive line to where they're used to doing those RPOs and those outside zones and those inside zones where they're kind of moving into a space. Yeah, they're working up to maybe a double a defensive lineman and go into a linebacker. They're doing all that, but they're always on the move. They always have help, and they're kind of working to a space opposed to a one-on-one, -on mono-e-mono down block against one defensive end. You know, we just don't have the talent to do that. A lot of people, for the longest time, Josh, they're saying, they're going out of shotgun and fourth and one. Why don't they get right. under center? You don't right. know how right. long. I wish uh, Sam Pittman, he's not going to throw his guys under the bus, that I was ready for Sam Pittman to say, oh, okay, all right, fine. Right. Y'all want to know why we don't do that and go line up under center and the defense is no, we're going to run it because my offensive line just ain't good enough to get one inch of push. That's why we don't do it. But I don't we can't do it because I don't want to hurt my offensive lineman's feelings. That's what was right. going on there, you know. But the thing is, back to that was just kind of addressing the talent issue that we had. Then Enos, it seemed like he couldn't find a way to make his offense mold around what he had. He was asking KJ 
to do stuff that he wasn't necessarily great at. He was often he was asking his offensive linemen to do stuff they weren't great at. He was all asking his running backs to do things that they weren't great at. And so you talk about this name that's been floating around. This is what's funny. Bobby Petrino. Yes, it'd be awesome if he could come back. If he comes back, Bobby, I hope you're watching. Let me coach your tight ends. But the thing about <laughs> Bobby is um, we all know what he did here at the University of Arkansas. Just a dynamic offense. He had a guy with Tyler Wilson and Ryan Mallett. They threw the ball all over the field, set record after record after record. And Bobby Petrino flourished in that style of offense. Very balanced, too. Then he goes to Louisville. He has a quarterback that couldn't be any further from a Ryan Mallett in Lamar Jackson, one of the best dual threat quarterbacks of all time. And he he molded his offense to fit Lamar Jackson uh, when he was at Louisville. And the same mind was molded to fit to a Ryan Mallett, and both offenses did incredibly great. So that's the genius of a great offensive coordinator and something I feel like Dan Enos missed. And it, sometimes it seems like he was a little too stubborn to kind of step away from what he wanted to do, at least for now, to just maybe get a couple wins. Because, Josh, there's a few games, like I said, where we only had two wins on the year. We could easily have five. Yeah, you can't – you know, you have to honestly not want to change anything in order to do what Dan Enos did. You, you have to literally decide, I am not changing a thing. No matter what I see on the field, I'm going to run my offense and these kids are going to get it or we're going to lose. That has to be Stop your mentality. Stop, Josh, that how has many to... weeks did I show film week after week after week? And I said, I don't want to feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but they just That's keep right. doing it and it's not working. And I said, surely they see the same things I'm seeing. But like, like you said, it's just stubborn. It's, it it kind of seemed very stubborn. You know, it had to be weird. Like I was saying, if you're if you're Sam Pittman, and at one point in time, you were the offensive line coach for Brett Bielema, and your offensive coordinator was Dan. You know, so effectively, that's your boss. And now you've taken this job and you've brought him in because you remember working with him. And you didn't have a half bad offense back then. It's pretty pretty decent at the time. Had a couple good running backs and Brandon Allen throwing the ball for you. So we we did we did okay. You bring him in because you're thinking here here's what you're really thinking, and here's what a lot of people don't know. And, and and I and I know this because I was told this by someone um, at one point in time. It was uh, on the inside, should I say? When KJ finished last season, and and Kendall Browse, I guess, decided that he was going to go to TCU. You know, the big goal there for the team was to try to retain get KJ. How do we retain KJ? You got to think uh, coming off of this couple seasons that he had come off of. You know, he he went into the this season being you know, on all the preseason watch lists. Manning Award, Maxwell Award, uh, David O'Brien Award. Um, and so you want to keep him from going to the NFL. Well, how do you do that? Well, the pitch is, is that, hey, listen, we're bringing in uh, Dan Enos. Dan Enos is going to run a pro-style offense. Dan Enos is going to get you prepared for the NFL. So here's why you need to come back. Because so far, we've been running this RPO. And when you get to the NFL, you're not going to have a clue on how to do it. Look at the quarterbacks that Dan Enos has coached. Oh, he did these guys over at Alabama as if these quarterbacks at Alabama weren't going to be the quarterbacks at Alabama. It was Dan Enos who who, who helped out Tua Tagovailoa and Jalen Hurts. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he he developed Brandon Allen. I'll give him credit for Brandon Allen. I think, but, yeah, but I think Brandon sure. Allen was a football guy from it. From 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 the mm -hmm. Brandon Allen was never a bad quarterback. He was always a good quarterback. He was a recruited good quarterback uh, yeah. out of Fayetteville High School. So you know, with all that being said, I still thought the Dan Enos hire was a was a good hire at the time that it was made. I honestly did because uh, I thought the same thing. Oh, Pro Stock is going to get KJ ready for the NFL. This is perfect because he can still always run when needed, but this is going to allow him to really open up his arm. Um, but it was not a good hire. It should not have taken that long to, for, for us to find out. And I think it's actually done the opposite for KJ. I think KJ could have gone to the NFL last season and, and potentially had ended up as a draft pick later, later rounds. Um, coming off of what he had done in the RPO, people would have still had question marks. All of his scouting report would have had question marks if he's a real, true pro-style quarterback or if he's just a college RPO guy. Um, but I think he, somebody would have still taken a chance on him. At this point, I think if you're KJ, you've got to go, dude, I've got to stay another year in college because 
I don't know that I'm going to make it to the NFL if I leave right now. What's what I've just put on my tape and their potential pro style offenses is not what the NFL wants. And if I want to make some money, I might make more money just staying in college, hopefully working some good NIL deals uh, because I may not even be on a roster if I go to the NFL. So it's, it's really kind of taking a toll for him as a whole. And I kind of hurt for him. If you know, if you think about it from a player's perspective of the position that he's in now, could uh, KJ come back? I, I don't even know. Yeah, uh, I think he actually can come back because because of the COVID year. You know, he was actually a Chad Morris quarterback uh, that, that came in uh, that uh, uh, Sam Pittman inherited. Um, so he yeah. would have a COVID year. So I do believe he has one more year. Um, I, that, I'm, I'm almost positive he does. We, we can fact check um, that later. Yeah, we'll fact check that later. If that is the case, yeah, he for sure would need to come back. Uh, you know, a, a mixture of Dan Enos and just not being able to adjust to what he had as far as a roster. And I will also say KJ as well. I mean, Josh, there were moments in that game that plays developed. There were moments that he had time. There were moments that he had receivers open, and he missed. He overthrew. Right. And um, this is where it gets tricky, you know, because I'm, I'm a guy who will be on the sideline. I will dap someone up, and I want the best for everyone. I want the best for KJ, you know. But, like, you know, if I was KJ's coach and I was looking at him in his eye, I said, KJ, you're not there yet. And as far as an NFL draft pick, if I'm being honest, if you have another year – and you have an agent saying this is your time to go. That agent, you need to find someone else because I, I just I would be surprised if he gets drafted just simply based off of what I've seen of the lack of ability to really pick apart a defense and know what's coming before it comes, not just relying on the play call to get that done. I just really haven't right. seen that yet. And KJ, if you see this and you, you take offense to it, fine, use it. Uh, prove me right. wrong. I would love to see you prove me wrong. I want nothing but the best from you. I'm just trying to keep it real with you. And but so he know, a lot he of knows. people just, yeah, I mean, I, I just, and so I think a little bit of mixture of that is why he didn't gel so well with the Dane Eno style of offense. And I would say this year and what we remember of KJ at his best is when he can break some tackles, uh, shake off some uh, pass rushers and get out of the pocket and rush into all this. That ain't happening. In the NFL. It ain't happening. He ain't shaking off them dudes from the NFL. They're built different, Josh. And everybody's running a 4-4 four, four and they weigh about 260. All right. So right. what he is really good at right now ain't flying at that level as far as being a big bruising type quarterback. Um, but all that well, being said, we've talked about – you got something to say real quick? Yeah. You, you mentioned KJ not throwing the ball well um, or just having having some some mistakes made in the, uh, the Mississippi State game. You know, when I look at it and, and I think about – uh, the offense as a whole, uh, when it's when it's being run that way, when you're running a pro style offense with two seconds. I mean, I watched a lot of film from last game. There's oftentimes that he's got two seconds. He gets the he gets the snap. Yeah. If he even has to to uh, fake Thanks. a handoff, there is no time. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got a you've got a defense out there um, who's seeing the play develop. No, it's a pass. Um, oh yeah. You know, sure. none of their none of their linebackers are, are pressed up. They're all dropped back into coverage, 10, 12 yards a lot, on often oftentimes. So it, it football is such a team sport that when you establish a run, when there's a run threat, uh, the receivers look better because the defensive line the defensive linebackers creep up. You create bigger gaps in the defense. When people are running zone, oftentimes you don't even have to be that great of a receiver. You hear a lot of people say, our receivers weren't even getting great separation. Sometimes separation isn't even necessarily uh, a big thing that you need with receivers, especially in college football. If you have the proper spacing and you're making the defense respect the run or at least think that there's a run coming and they're in zone, there's a lot of holes to sit in. And it's 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 the team as a whole, the entire offensive scheme as a whole that is not working and not setting the quarterback up for success, not setting our running backs up for success. Our, li our line is obviously not good pass protectors, so not setting them for up, uh, up for success. And our receivers are not – they don't have a quarterback back there who even has the time to let the play develop in the pocket. So that's what always – you know, that's why we've we've had this – idea and we've kind of forgotten that KJ is a good quarterback he's a good college quarterback right now yeah. he just needs to be in the right offense in the right scheme so that people have to respect his ability to run at all times they have to draw up to play the run and then KJ can pass the ball 
with mm-hmm. ease, our receivers have a better chance of getting open. And we've done it. We've done it. We've done it. We've done it. It's already proven. I don't get why we haven't had, you know, why we haven't gone, gone to it uh, earlier in the season. So Kenny Guyton, now a guy who knows how to play quarterback, who's taken over at OC. What do you think about him? What do you remember about him? Because um, I've got I've got some opinions on him. I, I mean, I, I I don't know that much as far as play calling is okay. concerned. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, and, uh, and we got to be a little well, tight here on time. I only got four percent battery left. Uh, but oh real quick, no, tell, how are you gonna how are we gonna do how are we gonna do four know, five four percent? I, I left my I left my uh, charger in Fayetteville this weekend, so this is all I got right now until I need to go to the car and charge it. But tell well, tell us real me, quick what, about our new, uh, the new guy calling the shots, Kenny Guy. Yeah, so Kenny Guy, receivers coach, who actually got to start. Uh, under Kendall Bryce, I believe, in Houston um, when he came out. He's Ohio State quarterback. Um, he he had a decent career at Ohio State when he played. He's not that old. He's 32 years old, by the way. So that's they, when, I, when I saw that, I thought he was older than me. When I saw he was 32, no, he's younger than me. I, I, I played against yeah. him in the Sugar Bowl. Right. So mm-hmm. he he wasn't um, – he he wasn't a always a starter at Ohio State, but he he does I believe hold the record for six touchdowns in one game at Ohio State, most thrown touchdowns while he was there. Uh, but he he went and played a brief stint, tried in the NFL, ended up I think with like a USFL team, then eventually came to Houston um, and started coaching there. Uh, I believe as a as a uh, quality control coach, wide receivers coach more or less, um, and that's how he got his in with Bryles. Bryles eventually brought him here. Um, to 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 Arkansas when when Kendall came on board as the offensive coordinator. So I think that we're going to see a guy who understands how to play quarterback, understands what KJ is going through, understands the type of quarterback that KJ is, understands the strengths of the RPO, probably take away some things that may or may not have worked because we didn't have – we had some plays that worked. We moved the ball at times, and then we get away from whatever that was. Um, and so I, I think you're going to see uh, a better offense – I'm not expecting him to come out and shock the world as the best offensive coordinator yep. in the SEC. He's a young guy. He's only been coaching since 2015, 2016. Uh, but I am expecting to see improvements based on his knowledge and ability of understanding the game, playing the game, being in KJ's position, um, and and obviously being groomed by uh, uh, Kendall Bryles there uh, in his offense. So I'm expecting to see some changes. Uh, I don't think he's going to have full control, but I think he'll have a lot of influence. And um, I'm excited to at least see – something change um and hopefully we do for the rest of this season because if it does we have a chance to win games i mean we 21 to 24 against alabama again lsu 31 34 we're right there if we have an any bit of an explosive offense we could have won those games yeah. um because our defense put us in positions to win so um uh, I'm, I'm excited to see to see what happens there with uh with with uh, Kenny Guyton, hopefully we uh, we yeah. have some success. We'll see, and he really doesn't have a lot of pressure at all. We'll say that. No. And so, like I said, it is a bye week, and so we don't have a game this weekend to kind of break down and adjust. So you know what's going to happen, Josh? They're going to get what? two episodes uh, yeah. of fourth and five before the next Hogs game. And so we just wanted to come on, address the issue with Dan Enos and everything that was going on there. Uh, our next episode, we want to uh, go ahead and end this now. And we want our viewers, after they kind of digest this, and then we want you to ask the questions. It's obvious. How the program even got here in the first place. There's a lot of different things going on. We understand that. We get that. But you just have to say this, Josh. You always have to look at the captain of the ship. And it's going to be about Sam Pittman. And so uh, we're going to go there. We're going to have some very tough conversations. And this is two guys and me and Josh who really love Sam Pittman. We like the player's coach mentality. We like that he continues to get these guys to fight. Is he sometimes too nice? Did he bring his friends in here? You know, What's the relationships like as far as running a football program? I know there's a lot of uh, quotes too, Josh, of like decisions mm-hmm. on field goals or calling timeouts. Uh, we can get into all that, but that's going to be in our episode uh, we'll shoot that a little bit later I'll, in the week. I'll, uh, but we I'll won't- tease you. I'll tease you a little bit with this. Sam okay. Pittman, Sam Pittman, in my opinion, should be our head coach next year. We should give him a chance to hire the right OC like he hired the right defensive coordinator. And I think that's the best option on the table. We'll talk more about next episode about why I think that's the best option on the table and uh, some of the challenges that we might find trying to replace him. Um, uh, Arkansas fans have high expectations for that. And I think uh, oftentimes they can be 
somewhat unrealistic uh, mm -hmm. on who they think we can get and, and how attractive we really are. And trust me, I want us to be attractive, but I also look at the reality of things too. And some people call that a, what do they, they call it? A weak mentality, a loser's mentality is what I've been told, but I'm not, I'm not, I just look at the real, I, li I live in reality, not mentality. Yeah. So I like to yeah. look at it. I like to look at it the way it is. Put that on a shirt. Live in reality, not mentality. I don't even know what that <laughs> means, but yeah, we're going to roll with it. <laughs> All right, y'all. Once again, thank y'all for tuning in. Uh, I'm DJ Williams. That's Josh Throne. You're watching 425.